during the week, Sue Short, our secretary, commented that she hoped that Matt Cheeseman wouldn't be upset. Jamie only got two verses. He had half a chapter. <laughs> but he's off with having fun with family, so he won't know unless Dad rats me out. <laughs> there are two aspects of today's discussion in the life of David. First is my stated purpose. David, the musician, is one of our most cherished images of David. Lyre in hand, lifting praises and psalms to God. The second is David's coming of age, moving from boyhood to man, the common shepherd to military general and eventually to king. And as we go through that transition, we start to see the paradox, some of the irony of calling David a man after God's own heart. On one hand, we can see some of the high integrity and character that such a title should exude. And yet, just as readily visible are all those character flaws that any mortal, broken human being has. And in truth, that brash David who stared down the giant Goliath with all the faith in God that any person could muster is maybe the last time we see David with such absolute heroic stature. But before we get into any of that, let us pray. I lift mine eyes into the hills whence cometh our help. We seek our help in the name of the Lord who makes heaven and earth. Grant a blessing on this time spent that the words spoken and the words heard might be one and the same. Spoken and heard, and they'll be pleasing in your sight. Amen. First, the transition. If you want to take a Band-Aid off of a boo-boo, how do you do it? Fast. You do it quick all at once so the pain goes quickly. Most of us would say yes. Enthusiastically. But you have to know there will be pain. Then there are those who will try and take a Band-Aid off slowly, convincing themselves that if they do it slowly and carefully enough, that maybe they can avoid the pain or even eliminate it. But it's my experience that that is hardly ever the case, and all that does is make the pain more pronounced and last longer. Because when it comes to boo-boos, pain is inevitable. In part, that is the issue when it comes to the transition between Saul and David. It could have been quick, but it wasn't. Not because it wasn't inevitable, but in many ways because Saul just could not see that his own time was through. Chapter 18 is all about that slow hard transition. There are several stories that take place, only one of which that we heard. Chapter 18 begins immediately following the battle where David defeats Goliath. But all through chapter 18 and the chapters that move beyond, his age becomes very ambiguous. As we move about various tales that range throughout this period of transition. Jonathan, Saul's son, befriends David, and they make a covenant together. 
while there are many, many things that can be discussed around that point, the important thing in our discussion today is the scholars point at this moment where David surplants Jonathan, the lineage to the throne. Additionally, David seems to gain Jonathan's loyalty over his father. The people of Israel also begin to sing David's praises over the praises of Saul. Saul has killed his thousands, and David has killed his ten thousands. The chorus is risen up in 1 Samuel 18, 7. And I can't stress it enough. If you're reading your Bible from cover to cover, chapter 18 follows right behind chapter 17. David the boy has just killed Goliath. One man, Saul the king, has been over Israel for several years. But the chorus goes up. David has killed his tens of thousands. I point this out because if we're going to be good studiers of the world, we have to recognize that in this section, there's fuzziness in these stories. They lose some integrity in the timeline in which they happen in comparison to the order in which they are compiled. It's somewhat unhinged but doesn't change the truth they contain. They may be disjointed, but they're still true and relevant. Another story that we get in chapter 18 is about David and how he declines to marry Saul's eldest daughter as promised to him in chapter 17 for killing Goliath. David claims that he is inadequate, the commoner, to marry the king's daughter and become a member of his family. Saul's eldest daughter marries another, but Saul's next eldest daughter, Michael, files in love with David. So Saul devises a plot that if David will go out and kill 100 Philistines and return with, shall we say, the appropriate proof, that David will have proven himself worthy to be the king's son-in-law. What Saul is really trying to do is get David to be killed at the hands of the Philistines. But David returns with the required proof and marries Michael. So two of Saul's children are now bound in loyalty to David. Saul is taking the band-aid off very, very slowly because he believes that somehow he can hold on to the crown even if he can see that God has abandoned him and favors David. So in between all the other stories that define this period of transition, we find the few short verses that we read today. David, the musician, trying to appease the headaches of Saul, the jealousies of Saul, the despair of Saul. Saul cannot be soothed by anything. He lashes out, attacks David, tries to kill him with the spear. Not once, twice David evades him. In the public place of the throne room, Saul tries to put down David, and everyone can see his raving madness. This transitions us more directly into the discussion of David the musician, which equally leads us into a discussion on the Psalms. Hopefully no one will be overtly shocked in this day and age 
to hear that David did not write all the Psalms or even a really whole lot of them. The book of Psalms is found in the Hebrew Bible is actually five books or scrolls that we conglomerate into one large book. Per the Hebrew tradition, five books of Scripture, the law, Torah, comprising Genesis, Exodus, Numbers, and Leviticus, and Deuteronomy, are ascribed or dedicated to Moses. And the five books of Scripture, or more appropriately, scrolls, of the Psalms, are ascribed and dedicated to David, which does not necessarily mean authored. There are a number of psalms that prove this out. By their own words, they show and tell of events that happened years, centuries after David's death. Psalm 137. By the waters of Babylon, there we sat down and wept as we remembered Zion. On the willows there we hung up our lyres and... There our captors required us to sing. Our tormentors, mirth, saying, Sing to us the songs of Zion. How we, shall we sing the Lord's song in a foreign land? If I forget you, O Jerusalem, let my right hand wither. Let my tongue be cleaved to the roof of my mouth. If I do not remember you, if I do not set Jerusalem above my highest joy. And again, Psalm 89. But now thou hast cast off and rejected. Thou art full of wrath against thy anointed. Thou hast renounced the covenant of thy servant. Thou hast defiled his crown in dust. Thou hast breached all his walls. Thou hast laid his strongholds in ruin all that pass by despise him. He has become the scorn of his neighbors. Thou hast exalted the right hand of his foes. Thou hast made all his enemies rejoice. Yea, thou hast turned back the edge of his sword, and thou hast not made his to stand in battle. Thou hast removed the scepter from his hand and cast his throne to the ground. Each of these psalms speak of the captivity. The Hebrew children exiled into Babylon under Nebuchadnezzar. As Rabbi Louis Jacobs points out in his articles, needless to say, the question of dating the authorship is totally irrelevant to the value of the book of Psalms. It's a religious outpouring of the highest order, recognized by millions of of worshipers, Jews, Christians, and others who use the Psalms to express their deepest emotion. That's the point when it comes to the idea of the Psalms. It's not about authorship or timeline. It's about what they say. Everyone has their favorite Psalm. It's the longest book of our canon. It contains some of the most famous lines of verse, whether used there and there alone, like Psalm 23, or requoted and used elsewhere, such as Jesus quoting Psalm 22 on the cross. Setting aside the point of whether David legitimately is author of any of the Psalms, it stands to fact. Psalms are the most human statements by God, of God, and about God. Of the Psalms, most of them are laments. Calls out to a seemingly absent God. Calling out, seeking where God is in the midst of the turmoil at hand. 
15 corporate laments, 39 individual laments, 14 considered specialized laments for certain occasions. 29 psalms are considered prayers of thanksgiving. 35 are liturgies meant for worship. But 45% of all the psalms cry out in despair, seeking to find out why God has disappointed. This is not about faith in a God who is there for you. It is a faith in God that is absent of any discernible presence of God. In my previous appointment, we had a Stephen Ministry program. Stephen Ministry trains lay people to be able to minister to people who are in crisis for a period of time, facing the grief of loss, challenges in dealing with financial hardship, the loss of employment, the ups and downs of life after divorce. One of our Stephen ministers who was not assigned officially was using her training to assist her sister who lived at some distance. Her sister had a daughter who was emotionally challenged and her husband had already dealt with a very difficult treatment, cancer treatment and had survived. And then suddenly... After eight years of a clean bill of health, her husband's cancer had returned. Our Stephen minister called me and asked if she could come in and chat about things one afternoon after an unusually difficult conversation with her sister. She shared with me the ebbs and flows of that conversation on the phone. And in the end, she said, my sister is just so angry with God. It makes her nothing but frustrated every time I suggest anything related to God, prayer, or reading the scriptures. All the things that I would lean on in that situation. She just didn't know what to do. I assured her she was doing just fine to keep doing exactly what she was doing because the important thing was right in what she had said. Her sister was mad at God. God has big shoulders. God can take it. But being mad at God does not deny the presence of God. It only proves our belief in God. And you see, David the musician in our historical tradition, giving us the Psalms, we can see all of his stories, all of the emotions, all of the ups and downs existing in the words and the poetry of the Psalms. And they give us permission to have all sorts of feelings when it comes to God. Anger. Yes, anger at God. Joy, love, abandonment, pain, adoration, thanksgiving, fear, faith, despair, neglect. Faith. Faith. In these days when we face all the kinds of strange emotions and challenges in our own transitions, 
questions, fears. We need to be able to cast all these feelings upon the shoulders of a God who can bear all things for the sake of God's love of creation. And that's what we have in the stories of David and the lessons we learn from the Psalms point to all of it. And that's a good thing. 